NFL Network presents America's Game, a countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number 12. In 1997, the Denver Broncos erased years of Super Bowl frustration. The Broncos' stunning upset of the Packers in Super Bowl 32 gave Denver its first world championship. The feeling of Super Bowl 32, getting that monkey off the Denver organization's back, that was complete euphoria. I mean, I've never felt anything like it. This one's for John. Quarterback John Elway had finally won a championship in his 15th season. The question was now whether Elway would come back for a 16th year to defend the title. At that point in time, I really thought he would not come back because you can kind of sense that if he can get a championship, that's what he was playing the game for. And once he got that, then there was nothing else for him to try to achieve. Man, I thought this was just a picture or something. <laughs> Me and him, we were the last ones in the locker room. I remember me and him standing side by side and laughing like, but we did it. We're the world champs. And I said, okay, that's fine and good. We are world champs, so what you going to do? He's like, keep it on the wraps. I'm coming back. If Elway was certain about his future that night, he began to waver during the offseason. He spent the next few months with family and friends away from the game. By mid-May, he was still undecided whether he would play in 1998. I'm really more tired of talking about it than anything. And so, I mean, I'd like to get a decision made and, and uh, you know, that'll, I'm, you know, I don't want, it's, it's the biggest decision of my life, so I'm not going to rush it. On June 1st, Elway finally announced he would come back at the age of 38. Everybody keeps congratulating me for coming back. The thing is, I never left. Bottom line is, I'm, I'm coming back so we can win. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's the only reason you play the game is to win. Elway would have a great chance to win in 1998. The Broncos returned 19 of 22 starters from their 1997 championship team, including number 84 Pro Bowl tight end Shannon Sharp and the most valuable player of Super Bowl 32, running back Terrell Davis. Entering their 1998 training camp, the Broncos had their sights set on nothing short of a Super Bowl repeat. Guys were so focused because we knew there are a lot of teams that won one in a row. In order for you to start to be special, you got to win two. We wanted to be special. We thought we were special. We knew we were special. Everything, man, full speed. Head coach Mike Shanahan wouldn't let his team get comfortable as defending champions. We got a standard we do around here. You guys want to be 500 football team? That's why we're going right now. You guys got to pick it up. We won the championship. That was last year. I think we recognize that we don't live in the past, and we have it's a totally different challenge challenge for us this year to come in there and play well. Once you win that trophy, there is nothing else. I told the guys, look, if you do not hold that trophy up at the end of the year. If that confetti does not fall down on your head and they're playing We Are the Champions in the background, your season is a failure. And if you look at it any other way, you're sadly mistaken. For years, 
the centerpiece of the Broncos' offense had been quarterback John Elway. But heading into 1998, the focus had shifted to fourth-year running back Terrell Davis. Davis had come a long way to become the leading man in Denver's attack. When I first came here, I was just hoping to make the practice squad. Never did I think that we would have uh, won the Super Bowl and I would have been the MVP. And now I'm back here getting another contract. And, uh, those things were the furthest thing on, on my mind. No one could have imagined what Davis would become when he was a sixth round draft pick in 1995. During his rookie training camp, Davis was the sixth running back on the depth chart. He nearly gave up on his career during the Broncos' trip to Tokyo for a preseason game. In Tokyo, I couldn't do anything right. It was the worst day as far as practice I've had probably ever. I went back to the hotel, and I, man, I, hey, I'm going to go home. I, I want to go the first thing out of here. Davis decided to stay. And later that week, he saw his first game action on special teams. On one kickoff, the unknown rookie changed the course of his young career. Absolutely crushed by rookie Terrell Davis. And then it's like, whoa, look at the rook, look at the rook. Like, who is that? And they're like, that's TD, that's, that's the running back. I said, running back? You know, Mike Shanahan said he wants some people to impress him. That's all it took was one play to make the whole team notice. And, you know, that's when we all recognized that he was a football player. And that's the highest compliment you can pay a guy. Wasn't a running back, he was a football player. Davis shot up the depth chart, and on opening day of his rookie season, he was Denver's starting running back. He became the lowest drafted player in history to rush for 1,000 yards as a rookie. His yardage totals climbed in each of his first three years. In 1997, he ran for more than 1,700 yards. Entering 1998, most people expected even more. You know, isn't there thoughts of, you know, being the, the, the third guy or the fourth guy to break 2,000 yards? Have I ever thought about that? Yeah. Who knew? 2,000 yards. I mean, seriously, no running back goes into a season thinking about 2,000 yards because it's so far-fetched. I'm putting that sort of pressure on you because I want to see you do it. Of course. I want to see you do it. Not only you got pressure now. When the 1998 season began, it was quickly apparent this would be a special year for Davis. In week two against Dallas, he raced to more than 100 yards in the first quarter. Here we go, 40, midfield, it's a foot race, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Dallas Cowboys! On consecutive carries, Davis scored on runs of 63 and 59 yards. While the Broncos' young thoroughbred was off and running, their old warhorse had pulled up lame. Quarterback John Elway strained his hamstring in the win and re-aggravated the injury in a victory the following week. Elway would miss four starts during the year, and in his absence, Denver turned to 12th year journeyman Bubby Brister. Near left zone with a C counter motion, okay? C counter motion, 18 tall. Brister was a good old boy from Louisiana who often played like a kid back in the bayou. Bubby Brister is one of a kind, and he gets in the huddle, and he just starts making things up. He's gonna fake straight out of that tower. It's a near right zoom or something like that. Brister's improvisation didn't always sit well with head coach Mike Shanahan. Why'd you run? Why, why'd you scramble? Why? Why? Why not? Because you brought him back to the ball, stayed upon to throw it. He's wide open. I know, Bubba. Hey, Bubba. Shanahan wasn't the only one who found his backup hard to understand. Bubby had a style and a language all his own. The greatest quote from Bubby is... <laughs> it makes me laugh just thinking about it. Bubby's talking about how, you know, the ship is on course. He's got to guide it. He said the greatest thing about this football team is we've got a lot of camaraderie ship. 
got a lot of camaraderie ship. So we were in the huddle after that, and we used to sing to him, come on, ride the ship, camaraderie ship, come on, ride, and, and we would be giving him grief. In guiding Denver's offense, Bubby was not so much captain of the ship as he was driver of a high-performance vehicle. I was like, okay, Bubby, this is a Ferrari. As long as you don't strip the gears or burn out the clutch, we're gonna be fine. Just, hey, keep it in first, let's go. Ready, Though Brister wasn't always the smoothest operator, behind him, the Denver offense never slowed down. Brister rolls right, steps up inside, and defender lobs on the end zone. McCaffrey, back of the end zone, touchdown! Bobby, Bobby, great job, partner. In Brister's four starts, the Broncos averaged 34 points per game, and Bubby's quarterback rating was better than Elway's for the year. He kept us going. Coming in that situation, I don't know if a younger guy could have come in at the quarterback position and provided the stability that Bubby provided for us. The inspired play of their backup quarterback and the steady running of the game's premier back helped the Broncos remain unbeaten through the first half of the season. Most championship teams are built with high round draft choices. But Mike Shanahan's 1998 Broncos were different. Quarterback John Elway was the only first round pick in the Broncos' starting offense. In fact, eight of Denver's 11 offensive starters were sixth round picks or lower. Number 80, receiver Rod Smith, was an undrafted free agent. Tight end Shannon Sharp was a seventh round pick. And number 87, Ed McCaffrey, was one of several Broncos who were cast offs from other teams. That did play into the guys' minds. The Broncos wanted me here. The other team didn't want me. They don't think I can play. And sometimes all they want is a guy to believe in them. Let's go, Eddie Mack. Mike okay. makes you believe that you're better than you actually are. Let's go, Shannon. Light it up. He always started by saying that. Guys, if I didn't think you can play, you wouldn't be in this locker room. I'm sure you guys stick together. You keep on working hard. We can accomplish anything. You guys are handpicked. Everybody that's in this room, you're here for one reason. I believe that you give us the best chance to win. Every day he said that. And guys started believing that. Because I could look around into the guys' eyes in that room, and it was like, we're special. Us all being low round draft choices or free agents, it was a real galvanizing force. We all rallied around that kind of call that, hey, we aren't supposed to be here. So let's shock them while we're here. Perhaps no Bronco traveled a longer road to the NFL than Mark Schlereth. A native of Alaska, Schlereth was a 10th round draft choice of the Redskins in 1989. As part of the Hogs' offensive line, Schlereth helped Washington to a world championship in 1991. Great blocking by the Hogs. They saw a hole you could drive a truck through. But after six seasons, he was discarded by the Redskins and given new life in Denver in 1995. Schlereth became a Pro Bowl starter on one of football's best offensive lines. And though 1998 marked his 10th season in the league, Schlera still approached every game with the same anxiety he had as a rookie. I was motivated through fear and paranoia. That's how I survived in the league. And uh, there wasn't a game that I walked into that I wasn't scared to death. Let's go, Mark. You a little, you a little scared? Yeah, you look a little scared. Scared to death of not producing, scared to death of letting my teammates down being made a fool of on national television. All those things were motivating factors for me. I was scared. I was scared to the core. Schlereth literally worried himself sick before nearly every game. I am a puker. Yeah. If I didn't actually produce vomit, I would at least have an overactive gag reflex and uh, most of the time would be able to produce some vomit before every game. 
in a little corner of the locker room where we dressed before games, there was always a trash can near proximity. So you didn't have to, you know, hurl one across the locker room where you could walk up to the trash can and, and get her in there. And then, you know, that's a chain reaction thing. You know how they say sneezing is contagious? So is vomiting in a locker room. One guy vomits, then you see the next guy starting to dry heave a little bit, you know. And While he couldn't control his upset stomach before games, Schlereth would purposely let loose with another bodily function on the field. I always looked at it like, I'm miserable anyhow. My knees hurt, my elbows hurt, my back aches, my neck hurts. I'm not going to sit here and hold this, too, and be, be miserable, you know? So uh, if I had to go, I'd just go. I'd just pee my pants, and I had no qualms about it. I'd be standing in the huddle peeing during a TV timeout break. Uh, it just didn't bother me. I was like, whatever. I'm looking up in the stands, and I'm going, these people are cheering. They have no idea I'm peeing my pants right now. Schlereth was never as free-flowing with his words. He was part of an offensive line that boycotted talking to the media. So while the linemen would rarely open their mouths, one of their teammates couldn't keep his shut. Look here, for the third year in a row, we got the best offense in the AFC. I remember telling my teacher when I was in high school, I said, I'm going to be famous. And I said, I'm going to have a doll in my likeness, and I'm going to send you one. But every night when I was in, in college, I would practice talking in, into the mirror. President, we need a National Guard. We need as many men as you can spare, because we are killing the Patriots. If you leave now, you get a hand start on traffic. There were times where you got to tell Shannon, Shannon, shut up, OK? I called him the fire start. Come on out here, man. No. Huh? Hey, what was that question? Shannon Sharp, the fire start. And I used to get so angry with Shannon because Shannon could get under anybody's skin. My teammates, the offensive line, they didn't particularly like it a whole lot. For the simple fact, I always got in arguments with defensive linemen. Hey, it's going to be one of them days. So he's basically starting fires across the line of scrimmage with the guy that I'm playing against. And so we, as a group up front, often had to become, you know, Fire Marshal Bill. We got to put out the fire. And many times, I would say to different guys across the line of scrimmage, you go, hey, listen, it's not 69 that you got a problem with here, all right? It's 84, right over there down the end of the line of scrimmage. And I tell you what, you can go after him and you can beat his brains in, and I won't come to his aid, okay? I said we were 10 or 14. Go get him. Shut him up for us. Obviously, I was mistaken. <laughs> as much as he could frustrate us at times, and he did, that guy was a great teammate. The Bronco, who never shut up, backed up everywhere. In 1998, Shannon Sharp led all NFL tight ends in touchdowns and receiving yards and was named to his seventh straight Pro Bowl. Sharp was another Bronco who had beaten the odds to become a star. And at midseason, this band of misfits, outcasts, and free agents were still on course to repeat as champions. Let's go, we got a chance for a big one. Fox 2 all go. In 1998, the Broncos' offense was better than ever. Quarterback John Elway was back at full strength late in the year. And Denver finished with a team record 501 points, an average of 31 per game. The Broncos' plan was to put their opponents away early. You know, we would script that first 15 plays, and it got to the point where we have got to score on that first drive. Let's knock seven out right now. Let's put seven on the board. Let's get seven. Let's get seven. Let's get seven. Just to let that shadow of doubt creep into that opponent that, oh, yeah, you know what? We thought we had a plan for him, but we don't really have a plan for him. We just drubbed opponents in the first quarter. We won games in the first quarter. The Broncos outscored opponents 144 to 54 in the first quarter. <laughs> By building such sizable leads, they often pulled Terrell Davis before the end of the game. You're out. You're out. 
Against the Eagles, the Broncos raced to a 28-0 first quarter lead. Davis ran for 168 yards in the first half. I remember at halftime coming back out, and my coach comes up to me and he asks me if I want to play in the second half. Now, I've never been asked if I want to play in the second half of a real a regular football game ever. One more series? No, I'm cool. Nah, just don't take me out. Want some pain? Davis sat out nearly eight quarters, the equivalent of two full games during lopsided wins. Yet, he still scored a league-high 23 touchdowns. He became just the third back in history to reach 1,000 yards rushing in the first seven games of the season, putting him on pace for an even bigger milestone. When he hit 1,000 yards after seven games, that's when 2,000 became a reality, and that's when 2,000 became something we talked about. Sometimes we're in the meeting, and I'm sitting there, and I have a pencil in my hand. I'm taking notes from the meeting, and all of a sudden, I'm jotting down some numbers. Let me do the math. I'm averaging 120 yards a game, and then you figure out, yeah, you know what? If I can maintain this average per game, I might break 2,000 yards. Davis continued to pile up yardage, and the Broncos continued to win. After a Monday night victory in Kansas City, Denver was 10-0, and questions arose as to whether the Broncos could produce a perfect season. Every other media session that you have, and you got a reporter asking, can you guys go undefeated? What am I supposed to say? No, we can't go undefeated? <laughs> it's taboo to talk about. It's kind of a superstition. You don't talk about a streak while the streak is going on, otherwise it'll end. So you internalize it as a player, and the whole team internalizes it. And so I think it does get burdensome. That's where the pressure starts to mount. I think the coaches got a little tight, too. I started to sense the coaches not letting the players do some of the things we used to do. Have a good time and joke around. I think there was definitely some apprehension about what's going on. We have a chance to do something special, and now we can't joke around as much. You guys, you guys have got to take this seriously. But yeah, I just felt that the team was getting a little tight. As the winds mounted, so did the pressure. In a 31-16 victory over the Chargers, the Broncos overcame a sluggish start and three turnovers to run their record to 12-0. It didn't look like they'd make it to 13-0. Against the Chiefs, Denver fell behind 21 to 7. I remember late in the game thinking, man, we can't lose. We can't lose. I don't want to lose. Not now. I don't want to lose right now. John Elway rallied his team in the second half. Denver overcame a 10-point fourth quarter deficit and went ahead to stay in the final minutes. Play fake, Elway pressure, steps up right over the center. think this matters to these Denver players? They're celebrating like they won the AFC Championship. Don't let them kid you, folks. The unbeaten streak matters, and it's going to continue at least for another week. Once you get to 13 wins, you definitely have to pause and think, we have three more games. Three more games. Imagine, can the Broncos go on defeat? Thirteen games had come and gone, and the Broncos were still unbeaten. And if they continued to win, they enjoyed the weekly perks that came with it. As long as we won, we got Monday off. We didn't have to come in. So I like that. I like not coming to work. Didn't have to really come to work until Wednesday. There were a lot of things that were coming automatically every week. Every week we would wear hats on Friday. We call it hat day. Okay, man, number one, that's hat week. You know, we're simple creatures. We're just simple cavemen. But a little thing like a hat, instead of having to jam that helmet on your head, that was big for us. So during the game, if we were down, they would walk around talking about hat day. Man, don't mess up my hat day today, okay? Don't mess up my hat day. The Broncos look for their 14th straight hat day 
on a cold December afternoon against the 5-8 and eight Giants. That morning, it just had a, a strange feel to it. Just something, just, it, it just, I'm like. The Broncos didn't seem like themselves most of the day. Yet, they managed to grind out a 16-13 fourth quarter lead. But with under a minute to play, the Broncos' perfect season came to an end. Home run ball down the right sideline, well covered, fought for the end zone. It is a touchdown New York to Amani Tilmer. The game is over, the streak is done. And the reality sets in that this run is over. First thing you think about is, man, we gotta wear helmets. <laughs> we gotta put helmets on Friday. That's hat day. And now your whole schedule changes because when you lose, you have to come into meetings on Monday. Terrell Davis needed to postpone an appointment he had made for the next day. Right after the game, I was going to stay in New York and be on Sesame Street that day, man. And I remember we lost the game. My agent came down and he asked Mike if I could still stay there. And Mike said, nope. I'm thinking, I got to fly back to Denver, go to practice, lift weights, and get on a plane back to New York to do Sesame Street. You're the man, Terrell. Thanks, you're the man. Appreciate it. You're the man. I try. You're, you're, the, you're the man. Don't worry about it. The Broncos were no longer singing the song of an undefeated season, and though they had to wear helmets to Friday practice, their heads were free of thoughts of the winning streak. There was a dramatic sense of relief. It has been a burden that we've had to carry, and now that burden has been lifted. I had mixed emotions about it. At one point I thought, yeah, good, I'm glad it's over with now, we don't have to deal with it. But then part of me felt, man, we, we, could, we could have done something special. The following Monday night in Miami, the Broncos lost their second straight game, and Davis was held to a season-low 29 yards rushing. His chances of reaching 2,000 yards now seemed unrealistic. After the Miami game, I was talking to Derek Lavelle. I remember him just looking at me like, man, you could have rushed for 2,000 yards this season. I'm thinking, yeah, you're right, I could have, man. I mean, really, that was it. I was like, yeah, I could have. It's, it's a done deal now, it's, it's over. 2,000 yards. Only O.J. Simpson, Eric Dickerson, and Barry Sanders had ever reached it. For Davis to join them, he needed 170 yards in a meaningless season finale. There was really no reason to do it, but I think we were dogged in our approach. We gotta go get this. You gotta give us a chance. And I think the coaching staff realized they were gonna have to do it. Good luck, TD. And there would be a mutiny if they didn't let it happen. By halftime, Davis had 82 yards. After every run, starting in the third quarter, we were shouting to the sideline, how many yards does he need? And then you can see on the scoreboard, because it's up there, uh, okay, TD needs 100 more yards. TD needs 90 more yards. Even Davis's sore ribs wouldn't stop his pursuit of 2,000. I had no idea how hurt TD was. And uh, frankly, I didn't care. He needed to get 2,000 yards. That's what needed to happen. By the fourth quarter, Davis was on the threshold of history. It was palpable. You could taste it. You could feel it right around the corner. The chance, TD, TD, TD. It was like some gladiator type thing, you know? <laughs> I'm sitting there in this, in this arena. And he is seven yards shy of 2,000 yards. Before the ball was snapped, it seemed like time had stopped. I'm thinking about, man, what if I take this all the way to the house? What if I fumble the ball? What if this happens? What's gonna happen when I do it? Am I gonna get up? Am I gonna spike the ball? Am I gonna go find my mama? I mean, I'm thinking about all this stuff. He's behind Elway. 
away by himself. He takes the hand off running left. Terrell breaks a tackle. He's got it. There it is. Terrell Davis. He's just become only the fourth player in NFL history to go over 2,000 yards in a single season. I looked at the scoreboard. I just seen it 2,000 yards, 2,000 yards. Yo, it's like, dang, it happened. That's the first time I had seen the number, the actual two comma zero zero zero. You see 1,500, 1,900, you see the one for a lot of those stats, you rarely see a two for season total. What's special, man? Terrell Davis had finished the regular season with 2,008 rushing yards. Hey man, rest time is over. As the playoffs began, the 14 and two Broncos focused on Jimmy Johnson's Miami Dolphins. Denver vividly remembered its Monday night loss in Miami just three weeks earlier. I remember seeing Sam Madison and some of those other defensive backs dancing, and they were celebrating. I mean, they were having a good old time, acting like they had won the Super Bowl. We're on the sideline, and I remember John said it. He said, we'll see those guys again, uh, and the outcome will be a little different. I said, I know. We wanted to kill Miami. And I'm not talking about, you know, no 21-7, no 21-3. No I'm talking about we wanted to embarrass them. I wanted Miami to walk back in that locker room after that game, be devastated, and physically feeling abused. Broncos accomplished exactly what they set out to do. Behind Terrell Davis's 199 yards rushing, Denver trampled Miami, 38 to three. Cuts back again, 10, five, he will walk into the end zone, touchdown Denver. Look at all that trash. Hey, hey, hey Monday go. night. Didn't they beat Three us? Ago, Monday night, they jumped around. Oh, she know me, man. After disposing of the Dolphins, the Broncos had one step remaining on their road to the Super Bowl. It would be easy for Denver to overlook the Jets. In fact, before kickoff, the team seemed more interested in the NFC Championship game between the upstart Falcons and high-powered Vikings. The Vikings had gone 15-1 during the season, and they would present a difficult challenge if they reached the Super Bowl. The game is on the jumbotron. We're paying too much attention to another game before we played our game. This is from 39 yards out. Mm. Here's the snap, the kick is up, and it is no good. Gary Anderson has missed a field goal for the first time in two years. He just missed it. When Minnesota lost to Atlanta, he just missed it. That was the worst thing that could have happened, probably. We thought we had won the Super Bowl already. We hadn't even played a game. Atlanta. Atlanta. I saw our team so worried about what happened during that game, we forgot to come play in our game. The Broncos offense that started so quickly all season was shut out in the first half. And things got worse in the third quarter. Up the middle comes Cascad, and they got it, they block it, and the Jets recover it. Testaverde takes the snap, the pitch to Martin running left. Touchdown, New York Jets, Curtis Martin. Trailing by 10, Denver's Super Bowl season was in danger of being swept away. But fittingly, John Elway's final game a mile high featured one more comeback. Play fake, Elway deep in the pocket, loads it up, got McCaffrey wide open, he makes the catch! McCaffrey's inside the 20-yard line. Denver responded with 20 unanswered points in the third quarter. The league's most valuable player ran for 167 yards, and the score that broke the game over. Terrell, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! All right! 
Denver's gutty comeback would be hard to forget, except for Shannon Sharp. The tight end had little memory of the game due to a hit he had taken in the first half. He hit me right in the crown of the head, and I don't remember anything. I don't remember driving to the game. I don't remember pre-game warm-ups. I don't remember anything. Only way I knew TD scored is from looking at it later. What? Sharp's head, he's out. We can't remember the play. Okay. All I remember was about a minute and a half left in the ball game, looking at the scoreboard and saying, how did we get the lead? Last time I remember, we were down 10-0. And now we're up 23-10. I'm like, how did this happen? And I'm like, what happens if we win this ball game? <laughs> and uh, Rob Smith say, but we going to the Super Bowl. I say, for real? I was like, who scored? All I remember is that the game's over and like, okay, everybody else celebrate. I'm going to celebrate too. Oh, the best coach in the NFL, period. <laughs> Yeah, period. Period. Make sure you remember this tomorrow. I'm gonna remember the hey. And I remember Mike asked me, Do you remember what happened? Nope, but I'm celebrating. We go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> That's all I need to know. The Broncos arrived in Miami as heavy favorites over the Falcons in Super Bowl 33. Head coach Mike Shanahan expected Atlanta to focus on stopping Terrell Davis, so he centered his game plan around the pass. He told tight end Shannon Sharp that he would be a featured target on Super Bowl Sunday. You know, I'm, I'm already in my mind, Super Bowl MVP. I'm already getting ready. I'm going to dance the world. You know, I'm getting all that, you know, I'm getting that all prepared, you know. You know, I call my brother and I'm saying, you know what, I'm a big game this week. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if I get some keys to a new vehicle. He said, for real? I said, yeah. I said, the game plan is kind of geared for me having a big game. Let's go, Shannon. Let's go make it happen. Mike is really not a guy big on pep talk. And I remember, he said, guys, if you don't beat this team by 50 points, you should be embarrassed. At left guard from Idaho, number 69, Mark Slareth. There was no excitement. There was just angst. My God. We've got everything to lose and nothing really to gain. Because if we don't win this game, it will be the most embarrassing defeat of Super Bowl history. And if we do win this game, good job, you were supposed to win it. I mean, it was almost a sense of duty. True to their plan, the Broncos went to their Pro Bowl tight end early. Three-step drop for Elway. Slam pattern is going to be caught by Shannon Sharp. A loose one to five. Sharp to the goal line. Did he get in? Sharp set up Denver's first touchdown, but it proved to be a costly catch. I got to the sideline and my trainer said, what's wrong? I said, Greek's my MCL. So you think? I said, Greek is burning. I said, I've had this feeling before. What's wrong with Shannon? Torres, partially Torres' knee, medial side of his knee. Medial collateral? You know medial what he did? Collateral, yeah. That hurt. That hurt. To sit over there with two and a half quarters to go and knowing that you're helpless now, you need the other guys to bring it home for you. I was like, MCL? Right here, With Sharp out, Denver turned to its other stars. The Broncos dominated the Falcons and completed their season-long mission. Elway boots and rolls to his right, stops, loads it up, throws down deep the middle of the field. Brad Smith got it! Here we go! In the fourth quarter, the Broncos put the finishing touches on their second championship. 
Elway with an empty backfield, runs a quarterback draw, lunges to the goal line, touchdown John Elway and Denver. Elway with a big smile on his face, and why not? As we're looking at each other, there are a lot of appropriate things to say, like, we won another world championship. You know, congratulations, I love you, man, you're the best. And he looks in my eyes, and I look in his eyes, and I said, hey, bud, how you doing? And he just started laughing, and he goes, you're an idiot. Afterwards, he said, of all the memories I have in football, he goes, that one in the end zone will be indelibly marked in my mind forever. He goes, you are an idiot. <laughs> the MVP of Super Bowl 33 is John Elway. And Denver will become the sixth franchise in NFL history to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. The first title had brought joy. The second had released a different emotion. Relief. Just... <sighs> Thank you. Glad that one's over. I remember after Super Bowl 32, staying up all night at the party, goofing around. I remember going to the party, Super Bowl 33 afterwards, having something to eat, and going up to my room and going to bed. Exhausted. Absolutely exhausted. That was the difference. Defending the crown versus chasing the crown. It's a task, it's a monumental task. At the beginning of the season, what did you think? Three months later, the Broncos' legendary quarterback retired. We all graduated from high school. We graduated from college. I'm just graduating from pro football. You know, I've got all these thank yous, and I'm not going to make it through them. When John Elway departed, so did the Broncos' championship magic. Early in the 1999 season, Terrell Davis, the player who had jump-started his career by making a tackle, essentially ended it by attempting to make another. The 26-year-old Davis suffered a season-ending knee injury and never returned to full strength. The man who was once the best player in football was forced to leave the game at the age of 29. I don't have any regrets about what happened. There's nothing out there that I haven't achieved. League MVP, Super Bowl MVP, 2,000 yard rusher. What else could I have done? There's not much. I, I don't look back and say, man, I wish I had went to the Pro Bowl. I wish I had won a Super Bowl. Davis will always have 1998 when he and a band of other low-round picks produced a season for the ages. 98 was history. It's got to be one of the greatest seasons of all time. I had never been a part of anything like that, where we had a chance to really rewrite the record books. What an incredible ride. Gosh, can you believe a bunch of undrafted yahoos like us went on a ride like that? That's special. That's really special. Additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game.